thank you all for joining us for Meetup Live. This is a Dismantling Social Injustice event on supporting the autistic community. Uh, my name is Mary Garcia. I'm the content manager at Meetup. And um, this is the 11th installment of Dismantling Social Injustice. You may have joined us in previous events where we've discussed things like pay equity, mental health, urban policy, equal rights, uh, civil rights for the transgender community, and so many other topics. Um, if you're joining us again, welcome back. If this is your first Dismantling Social Injustice event, welcome for the first time. We're very glad you're here. Um, <clears throat> our goal is to continue to foster important conversations on topics like these. And I'm very enthusiastic about um, hearing about how we can support the autistic community with all kinds of different information our guests will be sharing. Um, with that, I will kind of go into a bit of, um, excuse me, uh, guidelines for this event. So this event will be recorded, but of course, if you're a guest, you will not appear in the video. Um, you will be muted throughout the presentation. So no need to worry about noise. If you have any questions, please submit them in the Q&A box in Zoom at the bottom of your screen and um, closed captioning will be available for this event. So you can turn that on by clicking live description at the bottom of your screen and select your preference. Um, okay, so with that, I will um, share a little bit of information about our panelists. Um, so one of our panelists is Lydia XZ Brown. Lydia is an advocate, educator, and attorney addressing state and interpersonal violence. Hi. Uh, <laughs> thanks for joining us. Um, Carol, you're here. Good. Um, sorry, Zoom. It's just, it's something we've all had to deal with, and I'm so glad we worked this out. Anyways, I was just introducing Lydia, and then I'll be introducing you, Carol. So thanks. Um, okay, as I was saying, Lydia is an advocate, educator, and attorney addressing state and interpersonal violence targeting disabled people living at the intersections of race, class, gender, faith, language, nation. Um, Lydia is a policy counsel for privacy and data at the Center for Democracy and Technology, which is focused on algorithmic discrimination and disability and as well as uh, they're also the director of policy, advocacy, and external affairs at the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network. They're also the founding director of the Fund for Community Reparations for Autistic People of Colors, Interdependence, Survival, and Empowerment. Lydia is an adjunct lecturer and core faculty member in Georgetown University's Disability Studies Program and an adjunct professorial lecturer in American studies at American University's Department of Critical Race, Gender, and Culture Studies. Lydia is currently creating her own tarot deck, Disability Justice and Wisdom Tarot. I'm very interested in that. Um, diagnosed um, with, with uh, sorry, now for Carol Greenberg. Diagnosed with autism at 44, Carol Bring Greenberg is an editor at Thinking Persons Guide to Autism book, blog, and online community, and is the mother of a high support autistic team. In her role as a non-attorney advocate in New York City and beyond, Carol has written articles for and been interviewed by diverse media outlets ranging from Family Circle Online, Child Mind Institute, Spectrum, Zoom, Parents.com, to Neurology Now. Her most recent piece, Sensory Friendly Picks for Life on the Autism Spectrum, went live on wirecutter.com on April 8th, um, just earlier this month. So now that you know a bit more about our panelists, um, let's kick off uh, the panel discussion. So, you know, first things first, let's start with um, Lydia. If you could tell us what is autism and define neurodiversity for us. This is Lydia. It can be hard to come up with one definition of autism, in part because legal, medical, and community understandings of autism can be very different. 
and because of the way that even the supposed professionals and researchers have defined autism have shifted over decades and decades and recently. When I think about the best way to explain what autism is, I talk about it like this. Autism is a developmental disability, which means that an autistic person is born autistic, stays autistic throughout their life, and will die autistic. I don't really imagine dying in a different way. That'd be interesting to discover. Autism affects everything about a person's life. That's part of what developmental means. It means that you are either born with it or it begins in childhood, and that it affects multiple parts of your life. Autism affects the ways in which we communicate, in which we experience our senses, in which we interact with the world around us, with other people, and even with our own bodies and our own minds. It affects our thinking, our learning, our language, and even our emotions. And many autistic people commonly have other forms of neurodivergence, other chronic illnesses, or other disabilities in addition to being autistic. That's very common for us. To understand what autism is, it's harder to say here is one thing that explains everybody who is autistic perfectly. We are not identical to each other. And what specific aspects of autism affect our lives in terms of what capacities we have, what impairments we have, the things we struggle with can change based on our social context, based on what support we have access to, and even based on a specific situation. And that can be true for the same person throughout their life in multiple contexts. To understand neurodiversity, likewise, requires us to understand two different things. On the one hand, neurodiversity just refers to the biological reality that all people's brains are different from one another. There's not one type of human brain. There are many types of human brains. And Everyone has different specific skills and capacities, and everyone has different things that they struggle with or can't do at all. And what those are can change throughout a person's lifetime. They can change from moment to moment. And what any given person's particular profile of what capacities they have might look different as a whole from another person's. Neurodiversity refers to that reality, that we are not identical in how our brains work. But the second definition of neurodiversity refers to neurodiversity as an idea, as a movement, or as a philosophy. The idea that just because our brains are different does not mean that one type of brain should be considered normal or even ideal. That there is no such thing as a bad, broken, or wrong brain. And now to be really clear, the neurodiversity movement does not believe that people don't need support or that people don't have struggles or very real impairments or things that are incredibly difficult or impossible related to the ways that our brains work. That's a common misconception about that use of the word neurodiversity and what it signals. The neurodiversity movement believes that our brains are not bad, broken, or wrong. And that all of our brains and all of us as human beings deserve to be supported in whatever way makes sense for our lives and for our needs and for that to be on our own terms and to respect our agency and our autonomy and our humanity. I'm so sorry I'm on mute, I think I would know. <laughs> Thank you so much for unpacking these terms for us just to kick off the conversation. Um, Lydia, I'd also like to follow up by asking about how many people have been um, diagnosed with autism? This is Lydia. I'm Again. so sorry. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Were you, you did mean to address that to me. Yeah, I apologize. I thought you were correcting me for a second oh, there. No. I'm so sorry. We state our names in disabled centered spaces whenever we speak for the benefit of people that are listening in by phone, for people who might be blind, or for people who are just having trouble differentiating between one speaker and the next for any number of reasons. So in our community, we will commonly, uh, both in an in-person meeting or a virtual one, state our names every time that we speak as a way to signal which person is speaking. When there are interpreters or captioners present, it also aids the communication access team in being able to accurately relay information about the speaker. You ask the question of how many people are diagnosed with autism. And that question 
can also be a bit tricky to answer because the diagnostic criteria for autism from the medical and psychiatric industrial complex has changed over the last decades. At one point, there were several different diagnostic labels that might be considered within the umbrella of autism. And today in the current version of the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, published by the American Psychiatric Association, there is one category called autism. Many of us in autistic community, however, know that even operating off of the diagnostic criteria published in the DSM will not adequately capture all autistic people or result in identifying all of us. We know that there are many diagnostic disparities, particularly those that affect autistic people of color in Black, Brown, Latinx, Native, and Asian communities that affect autistic people who are assigned female at birth and as adults, autistic women, both transgender and cisgender women, and autistic non-binary people, whether assigned female at birth or assigned male at birth. And those are just a handful of examples that don't even get at diagnostic disparities along national lines, along linguistic lines, along which groups and which communities have access to diagnostic resources. That being said, Estimates of the prevalence of autism range from anywhere from 1% to one study that estimated that as many as 35% of people could be autistic. The general consensus is that the estimate is probably around 1% to 4% or something in that range, depending on who you ask. But again, we don't really know for sure exactly how many autistic people there probably are for a variety of reasons, often tied to racism, to gender-based oppression, and frankly, to ableism. Uh, that's interesting. I actually, I'm curious about um, some of the last part you said where um, factors like discrimination, including sexism, uh, racism, uh, how specifically do they affect things like testing and underreporting and things like that? This is Lydia. The expectations of what counts as autism and who can be recognized as autistic are often based on norms that assume the presentation of autism in cisgender white boys is what all autistic people will present as. And that's just simply not reality. Firstly, we're all unique. We are not the same as each other. But secondly, there are patterns to how different people's experience of being autistic are different between one group to another, which is, again, not to be essentialist. All cisgender white boys are not the same either. And all trans women of color who are autistic are also not the same in any particular demographic group. But there are some patterns to assumptions about what autism is supposed to look like, what kinds of people are supposed to be able to be recognized as autistic. But for example, people from other marginalized communities may be more likely to, if possible, try to mask being autistic as a means of survival. Because for many of our communities, it can be a matter of life or death if someone is identified readily as disabled or if they are not. Whereas white autistic people who are certainly not free from experiencing ableist discrimination, nonetheless have the privilege to move through the world such that if they are unable to or choose not to mask as much, if it is possible for them to make that choice, that they may not be in as much immediate danger from profiling by police, by child welfare services, by teachers that may refer a child to a more disciplinary or punitive placement from court systems, or even from strangers who might target that person for violence in very different ways than if that person is also known to be known to be transgender, known to be a person of color, known to be impoverished or especially homeless, known to be an immigrant or refugee or from a minoritized religious community or any number of other experiences that are not from the dominant group in society. And I do want to acknowledge, too, this is a global conversation, and I understand that. And so which groups and communities experience the most privilege, power, and resources in one area will not be the same in others. In the United States, if you are Christian, if you are white, if you... If you are cisgender and abled, then you experience a lot of privilege. But if we're looking in other societies, what exact groups of people might experience the most privilege can be different. If you were in the middle of Japan, 
white people are not the dominant group in Japan. If you are in South Asia, the presence of caste is very important in dictating which groups have access to power, privilege, and resources in addition to other social categories. So those uh, elements of people's experiences, identities, and community membership can also affect who is considered worthy of receiving support, resources, or access, and who will instead be cast off as burdensome and as disposable in society. And all of those ideas are wrapped up in ableism or oppression of disabled people. This is Mary. Thank you, Lydia, um, for following it up and for putting it in a global context. Um, I'd like to kick it over for, Care, uh, for Carol to answer the next question. On the topic of testing, uh, how does someone get tested for autism and how accurate are the results? Uh, you're on mute right now, Carol. I am now unmuted. I unmuted myself, which I should probably mute myself more often, I think. Um, but um, writing on what Lydia was saying, um, I encounter adults and teens who are most interested in diagnosis most often as an editor at Thinking Person's Guide to Autism. Um, I encounter parents in search of diagnoses for their children more often or evaluation for their children more often in my capacity as um, a non-attorney advocate here in New York. So uh, there are two very different categories. Age really does play quite a role too, and ageism plays quite a role too. So uh, if you are a teenage, cisgender, transgender, non-binary um, girl in this, in this country, you are less likely to be taken seriously, for example, if you ask your parents to see if you can be evaluated um for autism because they probably have the um even you know depending upon their their race economic status and so on even under circumstances in which they recognize that what autism might be um they will say well you're a girl and you're just a you're a teenage girl we took you to a psychiatrist. He said you had anxiety, that's it. So misdiagnosis is very common among young uh, women or, or people who identify as women. Um, and misdiagnosis is also common among older women, even when they have uh, an autistic child or autistic teen now, as I do. Um, although if you, if you are the parent of an autistic, um, you are more likely to get a diagnosis if you have the money and the privilege to know where to seek one out and can afford it. Um, so there are a lot of factors, as Lydia was saying, that play into this. Uh, as far as masking is concerned, it is a necessity for, or a lot of people interpret it as a necessity. I personally, as a speaking autistic, have experienced it as a privilege. I have the privilege of masking. Masking doesn't necessarily mean, it, the fact that I have the privilege of, of choosing whether or not I am going to mask doesn't necessarily mean that masking isn't harmful to me on a long-term basis because it does tend to lead to depression, anxiety, and a very high suicide rate among this particular demographic within the autistic population that I am in, speaking autistic, white women um, have a fairly high suicide rate, higher than some other autistic groups. Um, my son, on the other hand, has no privilege in terms, he has a lot of privileges, but he, he does not have privilege in the sense that he can't hide his autism. He cannot mask. That is not an option for him. He's um, mostly non, he's partial, I call him partially speaking. He's mostly non-speaking. Anybody who knows anything about autism, anybody who knows that he goes to a school for autistic children knows that he is autistic or that there is something very different about him. He can't talk his way out of anything, um, basically. And he has a lot of strengths, um, but 
as I often say, I talk good, he can do everything else well, and I can't. So um, yeah, testing is very, very difficult. And in large part because of access, in large part because of access, because we're, we as autistics in general are unlikely to be believed. And the more we have, the, the less privilege we have, the less likely we are to be believed by our own families, by professionals, um, by, by schools, by our, our places of employment. So yeah, um, it is very, very difficult. It's usually very expensive and we usually just don't have a lot of access. And even when we do have access, all kinds of shenanigans go on in terms of misdiagnosis because the model that it's based upon is a research model on cis white heterosexual men. This is Mary. Thank you, Carol, um, for talking more about testing and the limits of it. Um, I'm curious what you think about um, the educational needs for autistic children are, and I'm sure it varies quite a bit, but would you say those needs are being met in large no. part. <laughs> Can you speak more on that? <laughs> sure. <laughs> but it all boils down to no. Um, just no. It's almost ne those needs are almost never being met. Now we have a very good law in this country, and there are many laws in many countries. There's some law, there are some countries that don't have laws that acknowledge autism or disability much at all. In this country, we have an excellent law called idea the individuals with disabilities education um education um i'm sorry i'm losing words <laughs> help me out here this is lydia the individuals with disabilities education act first passed as the education for handicapped children act thankfully they changed the name thank goodness for that yes act i was gonna say appropriation no if it were appropriation we would actually have money no it's an act it's a good act. Um, if if people really followed it, it would be terrific. Um, if my if if I'm speaking as a parent of an autistic child now, putting on that hat, if our autistic kids really got individual education that was individualized to their particular needs, that'd be fantastic. But they rarely do. Instead, parents are put through what are called IEP meetings, Individualized Educational Plan meetings, where they are allegedly considered full functioning members of the IEP team, the team that puts together the plan. Uh, in fact, that's just not true. We appear at these meetings, if we get notice in time, we are, um, the law requires us to get written, prior written notice for in within five days of the meetings plan time, um, we're told nowhere that we can reschedule the meeting or certainly not clearly enough that we can reschedule the meeting if that's too little notice. Um, but if we do, if we don't, so if we do, don't show up at the meeting because we didn't know it was happening because somebody called us instead of giving us prior written notice, then we're out of the meeting, the meeting happens anyway, and the IEP that results from that meeting that we never attended or that our child over 14 never attended, um, which is also you know, an option for kids over 14, um, then we're out of luck. They, they come up with an individualized educational plan that is generally a cookie cutter plan that is not at, in any way individualized to our child's needs. Now this individualized education hope happens within um, what is called the least restrictive environment necessary. Um, now, it would be great if our schools in general, if our school systems in general, really did support a least restrictive environment, uh, really did support inclu true inclusionary education where, where, you know, however you might want to discuss the terms of inclusion, um, where all children would have access to an education that is appropriate, that would be terrific. But unfortunately, generally speaking, when kids are in a least restrictive environment, they end up overwhelmed, autistic kids, 
end up overwhelmed in very, very large classes where they get almost no individual attention and their sensory needs are completely ignored and they end up you know, just too overwhelmed to learn anything, much less feel comfortable enough to feel even baseline safe being there. So um, that's difficult too. My son, because he is high, high support, the um, we we have determined, and because I'm an advocate, and because he has a good lawyer, and because we have the privilege to afford all that and attend IEP meetings, and you know, set up everything for him, he is appropriately, I think, placed in a an environment that is fairly restrictive. That is among other autistic kids where he does best and he is he gets uh, a high level of support um, and that has worked out for him but only because we've been you know in constant communication with the school and constant communication with the teachers and constantly sort of riding on them so he's uh, he's done pretty well but even so the program itself uh, has a lot of flaws because there are basic misunderstandings about autistic people and how our brains function. Uh, so no, we we don't really, none of us have much access and the less privilege we have, the less likely we are to have access to a truly appropriate education for each of our kids. This is Mary. Thank you, Carol. Um, I'd like to take it a step back and kind of get some historical context on this. Um, Lydia, can you talk to talk a bit about legislation that's been introduced to support the autistic community and um, maybe speak to some of the history of autism in the United States? This is Lydia. The word autism as we use it today, didn't really enter public lexicon or the way that people talk until about the middle of the 20th century. But that doesn't mean that autistic people never existed. There are a lot of complicated politics for very good reason about trying to say retroactively diagnose people post-mortem. So it really isn't possible to say for certain, here are some specific people we know of who were alive long before autism was considered a known category of diagnosis or identity that we know for sure are autistic. But what we can do is recognize traces of autism, descriptions of people who lived in the past, whose lives mirror experiences that many of us know from our own personal experiences as autistic people. And for those of us who also are friends with or caregivers for other autistic people, recognizing what we see in those who we love in stories about people from our past. The history of autism, therefore, is kind of difficult to try to trace very clearly since that word wasn't in our vocabulary until within the last 100 years. But disability as a category encompassing a wide range of possible disabilities has always been part of human societies and cultures. And what ways of existing, being, or moving in the world have counted as a disability or not have always shifted depending on cultural context, geographic context, or specific moment in historical time. In the United States, the history of disability in our law and policy stretches very far back, but we didn't necessarily explicitly talk about it as disability. I spend a lot of time talking to my students and other people about what it looks like to trace ableism, disability discrimination, prejudice, and oppression through US legislative history and the ways that the US government has operated in deploying ableist ideas to justify, for example, land theft and occupation and genocide affecting native people's nations, in justifying chattel enslavement of black Africans, and in justifying our immigration laws that have often put very specific, strict, and restrictive quotas on immigration, especially from immigrants of color, based on ideas that people of color are stupid, that people of color are irresponsible, that people of color are inferior to white people, that people of color are dirty or diseased, 
ideas that have at different times affected Black people, Native people, Asians, and many other immigrant and refugee communities and descendants of people who've been enslaved. And of course, of all different Native peoples nations throughout this land that we now live on and that we now work on. The notion of disability as a very specific category of people in terms of civil rights didn't really arise until the middle of the 20th century. When public discourse about disability moved from being exclusively pity and charity based, disability is seen as being in the private realm, that an individual community and perhaps a church, or if you belong to a different religious community, a different religious community might take care of, might give alms to, might give aid to people with disabilities. In the 1960s and 1970s, disabled activists in very different spheres in some spaces, self-advocates with intellectual disabilities, many of whom were languishing in large state or institutions. And in other cases, activists who were primarily neurotypical, but with physical disabilities living often outside of institutions began to organize efforts of what it would look like to advocate for research policies and services that would help disabled people, but be informed by the perspectives of actually disabled people, where disabled people could be understood as humans and very importantly, rhetorically as citizens, as people who could contribute politically and economically on par with non-disabled people who were already assumed to be contributing members of society. And um, our earliest legal victories actually centered specifically around education and the workforce. 1973 was the same year as passage of both the original Education for All Handicapped Children Act that Carol was just alluding to, now called the IDEA, which guaranteed the right to an education in public schools with services for qualifying children with disabilities. And it was the same year as passage of the Rehabilitation Act, which was the very first civil rights law broadly affecting disabled people, not just as children. It affected specifically federally funded programs and was focused on employment, guaranteeing a right to non-discrimination and equal access for disabled people when participating in or receiving services that could be called programs, activities, or services that received federal funding or were federal in nature. In the 1980s, Congress passed another law called the Developmental Disabilities Bill of Rights and Assistance Act. And that was the first law that specifically set aside funding for policy research and services aims, specifically benefiting people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. That's the category that autistic people fall into specifically when most people divide disability into types of disabilities. And, and that law was in the 1980s, it created the earliest protection and advocacy systems, which provide legal assistance and aid to investigate claims of abuse or neglect or of disability discrimination in employment, in housing, in social services, in benefits, or in many other areas of life for disabled people. It gave funding to councils for developmental disabilities, and it gave part of the funding for the network of university centers for excellence in developmental disabilities, which are often homes for research and some forms of services, mostly for families of children with intellectual and developmental disabilities. In 1990, Congress passed the Americans with Disabilities Act, the most well-known piece of legislation affecting disabled people. So that includes autistic people. The ADA was the first sweeping piece of civil rights legislation that was not confined only to federally funded programs, activities, and services, and that affected people with disabilities across the lifespan. The ADA's separate titles protect against discrimination in a variety of areas, including, importantly, places of public accommodation. And the ADA passage in 1990 marked a move at least legally and politically from understanding disability primarily as being scattered into different aspects of the lifespan or scattered based on disability group or as primarily a charity pity issue and move toward thinking about disability as being a civil rights issue, an issue of civil and political and in some people's way of thinking about it of human rights. And that has led us toward uh, three decades and now counting of advocacy both within and outside legal and political institutions 
both both focused on civil rights and for people like me who operate informed outside of just the rights-based framework of a broader notion of social justice, of wanting to challenge the core values and beliefs that disability, including autism, means that people are less than or not fully human. Ideas that you just can't legislate away. We've had the ADA in place now for more than three decades. And we've had the IDEA in place for more than half, well, almost half a century. And yet, even though we have those laws in place, disabled people still face rampant, systemic, structural, and institutional discrimination in all parts of society, just like Carol was talking about in our school system. And those harms of disability discrimination always fall hardest and worst on disabled people who are at the margins of the margins. Even the U.S. government's own Department of Education's civil rights data collection, for example, shows that rates of punitive discipline, suspension, expulsion, referral to punitive alternative schools, arrests in school, restraint and seclusion, which can be deadly practices, are highest when used on Black and Latinx disabled children than for any other demographic group. And that's just one example of the ways in which disability discrimination or ableism is so entrenched in our society that even though we have these laws that are supposed to protect us, and don't get me wrong, it's a good thing we have those laws, those laws are not sufficient to actually fully address, let alone eliminate the problems that disabled people face. This is Mary, thank you, Lydia. Um, Carol, on the topic of um, you know the history of autism in the United States or worldwide, um, is there anything else you'd like to add to the discussion? This is Carol, and I would like to um, talk a little bit about what it looked like to have um, a diagnosis for one's child of autism back um, even 40 years ago or 50 years ago, as opposed to what it looks like now, uh, what has changed and what hasn't changed, at least in, in my family's life, because as I've said um, elsewhere, um, very luckily for me, we, had, we have a long history of, of autism in my, in my own family that my father who uh, recently died acknowledged himself he was absolutely convinced that he was autistic, absolutely thrilled to find out that he was autistic, to realize it after my son was diagnosed. And so in the history of my family, I have a cousin who's autistic on the other side of the family. Um, the talk was always about how she, how it was so unfair that to the family that her parents did not institutionalize her, how they were so burdened with her, how it was so awful that they had to deal with her. And she was eventually, I mean, to, to my um, distant cousin's credit, they did not institutionalize her in one of those large institutions where she would have gotten lost and forget about her, forget she ever existed, which was the advice that was given to the parents of, of kids um, who are now my age. Um, autistic kids who are now my age. So she is now in a group home. Um, I think it's smaller than the institution they had recommended when she was much, much younger, but it's still an institutional setting. Um, fast forward, um, doctors are on the, on the plus side, doctors in this country are no longer as often recommending at least to white parents uh, with, with some economic privilege that their kids be locked away and forgotten about um, from the very get-go. But the, so that's a, that's a, some positive change in a very, very small and very privileged section of society. Um, but there still is a, an air of pity. Um, certainly whenever I talk about my son, um, there is an air of, um, well, he will never do this, he will never do that. Um, when anybody, when practically anybody talks about my son, which is amazing to me because as an autistic, I myself know and have experienced our punctuated learning style. In other words, a child 
between one and three, any child of any neural status is going to have huge leaps in their very early life. And everybody expects that, but they expect that learning process to become more gradated as they get older, to become slower and more gentle rolling hills, not mountains. For autistics, in my experience, in my family's experience, those gradations never appeared. It was always spikes. It was always like a switch going off all of a sudden. So there is no way to predict when an autistic without, without a lot of other co-occurring conditions is going to suddenly acquire a skill. Um, so for somebody to say to me, I, I'm always terribly upset when somebody pretends to have a crystal ball and says to me, your son will never X, Y, Z, your son will never hold a job. Well, that's ridiculous. Who knows what kind of, my son has a lot of skills. He might hold all, there are any number of jobs he might be able to hold. Uh, your son will never communicate effectively. That's ridiculous. AAC technology is, is is increasing by the moment, if only we could keep up, and this is another way in which autistic children are not receiving an appropriate education. Parents are not receiving any education or training into using the AAC technologies, even the most basic AAC, assistive augmentative communicative technologies, um, to communicate better with autistic kids in the way of their choice. In other words, instead of forcing them to speak, when speaking is the hardest thing in the world for them, um, that they be allowed to communicate in a style that best suits them. So there is no, it will never happen for most autistic people. No one knows what could or couldn't happen given the right circumstances. And given the notion of us as full human beings, and as Lydia said, full citizens. I can't tell you how many times I've written, I'm autistic and I vote over the past few years. I've become very, very um, active in our local political community, our state political community, and nationally um, for causes and, and writing postcards to voters and all kinds of political activity. I believe very strongly in voting. I've done, I've devoted a lot of my time and energy to getting out the vote. And I've taught my son about how sacred it is. One of my proudest moments was when he was 16. And I said, how old are you? And he said, 16. And I said, in two years, how old will you be? And he said, 18. I said, what will you get to do when you're 18? And he said, vote. <laughs> and I was just, I almost cheered up because there is no way anyone can predict what children can and cannot do when they grow up, they're children, they will grow up. Uh, I'm no more, uh, of course, I'm nothing like your child right now um, because I'm an adult. Um, you don't know if you are the parent of an autistic what your child will be like, especially given whatever your particular circumstances are. Uh, does that help? answer the question. I often ask that because I often get off track. So I do very, that was great. That was super edifying. Um, one question for both of you is um, kind of the million dollar question. How can people support the autistic community, whether we have autistic co-workers, loved ones, partners, you name it? Um, for me? Uh, for uh, this for either of you i would say listen to us and take us seriously for crying out loud you know when we say what we need that's what we need assume we're on the level and try to live up to what it is we say we need if you don't understand what we're saying we need then ask us questions and assume that you are capable of understanding our answers assume that you are capable of continuing the conversation in whatever way suits the autistic member of the conversation best. That is the best way to be an ally to the autistic people in your lives. That's the first step. This is Lydia. I would echo what 
this and add to that, that this is a key feature of what self-advocacy, disability rights, and disability justice movements have been saying for decades. Presume competence. Believe that autistic and all other disabled people know and understand things about our own lives, about our own bodies and minds, about our preferences, our needs, and our desires. Even if, and even though, sometimes we'll make bad decisions, just like non-disabled people do. Even if, and even though, sometimes we will be irresponsible or make unwise decisions, just like non-disabled people do. And even when the particular autistic or disabled person isn't necessarily able to articulate clearly in a way that you might understand what it is that they are trying to express, that doesn't mean that we're not communicating. It simply means that the other half, the communication, the understanding part there, communication is always a two-way street. What, per what one person is expressing and what the other person is understanding. If you do not understand what a particular autistic person is communicating, part of that is on the autistic person, not necessarily knowing how to express it in a way that might be understood by others. And part of that is on the non-autistic person in that interaction for not necessarily knowing yet how to understand how that autistic person is communicating. And I want to express and reinforce that this is especially true even and particularly in the hardest, most uncomfortable and most confusing situations, even and especially if an autistic or other disabled person appears to be in distress or in crisis, if a person is experiencing incredible difficulties in communication, if this person is extremely overwhelmed, that is when it is most important to presume competence and not to assume that someone else has to decide for that person, or that that person just needs to be treated as a problem to be controlled or managed. That is when it is most important to presume competence and to enable the dignity of risk. This is Mary. Um, I'd like to bring up one question from the chat. So um, an audience member asked, Hi, I was told to, due to the reasons you mentioned, it's very hard for high functioning autistic adults to get diagnosed. For people who can't get a diagnosis, are there recommendations for finding resources on coping with daily activities and struggles? Um, well, uh, there are a lot of wonderful blogs written by autistic people now that are out there and very readily available. This is one of the great gifts of the internet. Um, so just as I often find myself in discussions with non-autistic people about what they can do for us or to help us or to ally with us, um, it's sort of the same advice. Talk to autistic people who have been where you are right now, who have struggled with this, and see what their experiences have been and think about um, whether your experiences, whether you might benefit from some of the same things that they did. Uh, great. At one point, Carol, I believe you mentioned masking. Uh, someone in the audience asked, what is masking? Well, it's not, uh, unfortunately, the word masking now has the meaning of putting on a mask to keep everybody safe. So um, I certainly have been trying to substitute the word camouflaging recently because of the pandemic. Uh, but masking traditionally in autistic circles means trying very hard to appear as non-autistic as possible in order to blend in for some perceived benefit. Um, it happens most frequently in group settings like um, employment or uh, schools or things like that, where your job your, and, and your sole means of income may depend upon your being able to mask. Or if you come from a culture um, where masking is absolutely necessary because if you don't mask your family, your entire family will suffer. Um, the consequences of knowing that 
a family member is autistic. There are many cultures right now all over the world um, where the marriage prospects of all the siblings are, are at stake when it is revealed that one sibling has autism, that one sibling is diagnosed as autistic. And so therefore that, that child is essentially hidden away. Even if they go to a school for autistic children and are treated charitably, as Lydia was talking about, um, that child's existence is, is downplayed. And speaking of that, my uh, son has just made a polite request, so I'm going to mute myself and let Lydia take over now. It's good timing because we've actually reached the end of this um, event. I want to thank Lydia and Carol so much for joining us and sharing um, the knowledge and advice for this panel. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone in the audience who joined us today. I hope you learned as much as I did. And if you are looking for a recording of this event, one will be available on the Meetup blog, which you can find at meetup.com slash blog. The Community Matters blog will also be sent to you via email if you RSVP'd to this event. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a good evening.